3 Golden Eagles for War Thunder. Link in the description. Hello you sexy beasts, welcome back to War Thunder. The hype train is rolling, dev blocks have been releasing left and right, and with two dev servers being owned to the public in the space of one week, it's pretty safe to say that patch 1.63, nicknamed Desert Hunters, is coming very soon. At this stage, most of the stats are going to be set in stone, with only minor tweaks and battle rating adjustments to be expected once a patch goes live. There's 23 new vehicles, gameplay mechanic changes, new maps and a couple of, let's say, unofficial changes that we'll take a look at. So let's not waste any time and get right into it. A major and welcome change is the addition of realistic zoom levels for the gunner's sight on tier 5 tanks. Depending on the tank, you now get a massive zoom in. This is a game changer, making long range combat and sniping for weak spots much, much easier. For now, only tier 5 benefits from this change, although more tiers might get them in the future. Damage of 30 to 50mm anti aircraft guns has increased. This should result in higher caliber SPAAs receiving more consistent kills against aircraft in combined battles. The turret armor on the M60 and M60A1 has been nerfed. Yes, you heard that right. Despite already suffering from massive weak spots, the top armor above the gun mantled is now also a weak spot. Honestly, I have no idea why this is a thing. Post-war German vehicles received the tricolor CARC camouflage. Looks quite nice. The map Kursk has been changed, with the addition of a church in the center village and improvements in balance. This is a big one. The spawn point requirements for the Flakpanzer 1 Gepard and the ZSU 57-2 NRB has been increased, which should result in less spam. Now for the unofficial patch notes as data mined by Mike10D from the subreddit. Take these with a grain of salt, as they are not officially confirmed by Gaijin, but rather taken from the game files. The F6F3 and Mosquito FB Mark VI seem to have received slight buffs, with the LA9 actually receiving a nerf. It also seems like the SM79s now all have their own flight models. The APTS FS shell fired by the T62 now have their own ricochet chances and after armor penetration effects. This results in more shell fragments, which have slightly higher penetration and as such should result in higher damage overall. New models have been spotted which might come in future updates, such as the P66 Vanguard, the new, a new PT76 and a Hawk 3, as well as a possible French tree including the POTES uh, 630, POTES 633, VG33, VB10C1 and the MB157. There's also been a lot of ship models added which I won't really list here, this is way too long, but I'll leave a link in the description down below for you to check out. Those of you who have been on Reddit for the past weeks have certainly spotted the models of helicopters. Now, these are almost certainly going to be AI controlled and are rumored to be the creation of an upcoming Vietnam map. But it's an interesting point nonetheless. There also seems to be new maps in the works, namely Ardan for tanks and African Gulf map for ships. And new weather types also in the works, designated North Sea. Oh god, 23 vehicles to review in one video? I'm not gonna lie, I might have spent about 10 hours just to get the footage and stats of every single one. Let's start with the Germans. Verabus will find this patch very interesting. There are three new top tier tanks, an 88mm flag truck and a big flying boat. Kicking things off with the Leopard 1A1A1A1A1A1. Apart from the redesignation, this tank is a flat improvement of the Leopard 1. It features the same 105mm gun with the same ammo choices, but is fitted with a stabilizer that increases its vertical traverse speed from 4.2 degrees per second to 24.5 degrees per second. It is also equipped with additional space armor, 
35mm on the gun mantles, 20mm on the turret sides and 5mm side skirts. Although their use is limited. Against Hesh, the gun mantled armor did seem to prevent spalling into the turret, but the shrapnel still traveled through the top armor into the frontal armor rack regardless. Heat FS shells aren't stopped by the spaced armor at all. The new Leopard also features an additional MG on the top, which gives it a little more defense against aircraft, although it also makes it easier to spot. It is also 2.4 tons heavier, making it slightly slower in overall handling. In summary, the slight additional protection and faster target acquisition make it a good companion to the Leopard 1, but doesn't really bring anything new to the table. In the SPAA department, we're getting the Flakpanzer 1 Gepard. This massively tall machine is equipped with two 35mm cannons with a total of 680 rounds, firing at 550 rounds per minute. Horizontal traverse is very fast, the guns can traverse from negative 5 to 85 degrees in the vertical, and it doesn't get a reload. Ammo choices are varied, with the stock belt featuring an API type with 68 to 50 mm of penetration up to 1 km away, and a special AP belt featuring a HV APT shell with up to 112 mm of penetration at close range. The chassis is that of a Leopard 1, featuring an 830 horsepower engine and propelling the 46 ton vehicle up to 65 km per hour. Armor is mostly negligible. The 30 to 50 mm of effective armor will protect you from heavy machine guns, but Anything else will go straight through you. Add to that the massive tallness and the spinning radar dish on top, and you're one extremely easy to spot and kill targets. The gay part also only gets free crew, which almost guarantees a one-shot kill after the first hit. As such, the gay part is excellent at taking out any kind of aircraft and light to medium tanks from a range, but it's extremely easy to spot and kill in return. Next, we have a new ATGM platform, the Raketenjagd Panzer II Hot. This tank features 20 mouse aimed ATGMs that travel at 240 meters per second and have a massive 800 mm of penetration. Contrary to the earlier Raketenjagd Panzer, you can only fire one ATGM at a time, but thanks to the periscope acting as the gunner sight, you can indeed fire them once completely behind cover. The firing arc is pretty narrow, but after firing, you can steer the ATGMs pretty much 90 degrees to either side. The reload of these missiles is very quick as well, taking between 10 to 8 seconds depending on your crew level. Armor is pretty much non-existent, and with only 4 crew it also doesn't benefit from particularly good survivability. The AT gems take a bit of travel before they can be mouse controlled, and given their high firing point they are mostly useless at very close ranges. That being said, this tank has the potential of becoming the new IT-1 with its ability to fire from cover, the fast reload time and the sheer amount of missiles in reserve. Be very afraid of this foe. In a more interesting addition, we are gifted with the 8.8 cm Flak 37 Selbstfahrlafette of 18 ton Zugkraftwagen. Try saying that 5 times fast. This is essentially a half track truck with the fabled 88mm uh, flak gun, the one that was later adapted for anti tank use in the Type 1. Despite technically being an AA gun, it is classified as a tank destroyer and sits just before the Dicker Max in the tech tree. The gun is functionally identical to the one found on Type 1, with a few differences to gun handling. Mainly, it has a very poor 3 degree depression, as is to be expected from an AA gun. However, it can also elevate up to 85 degrees. The horizontal traverse is very, very slow, although the gun can rotate to full 360 degrees. The key feature of this vehicle is the insane fire rate. With a fully upgraded crew, you can put out an 88mm APHE shell every 5 seconds. 5 seconds. This thing is extremely good at dealing with multiple heavily armored targets at long range. Did I mention it as freeloaders? In fact, it has a total of 6 crew, although 4 of them are pretty exposed operating the gun. Armor is, as expected, almost non existing. The 14.5mm all around will protect you from rifle caliber MGs at long ranges, but anything else will rip straight through you. The 230 horsepower engine propels this 25 ton vehicle up to a top speed of 40 km per hour, but given the steering is being done by wheels, it can't really rotate on the spot. Oh, by the way, you can technically use this thing as an AA gun, but don't expect to actually hit anything but the biggest and slowest of targets. In summary, this beast will be an extremely powerful weapon in wide open maps and long ranges, but it will become almost useless in close quarter combat due to its ridiculously slow turret traverse and laughable gun depression. That said, 
it will penetrate and most likely one shot anything it hits, in true glass cannon fashion. And finally, the Germans are getting a massive flying boat. The BV-238 is a premium flying battleship with two 20mm MG-151s mounted in a turret on the top and four 13mm MG-131s mounted in four turrets all around the aircraft for a total of 16 guns. It has six engines and carries 20 250kg bombs for a total bomb load of 5 tons. This thing is bigger than the B-29 and might very well be the biggest thing on the battlefield. The fuselage is mostly invulnerable to damage, with the only critical component uh, in it being the tail control. That being said, you have massive fuel tanks and spars all along the wings, and you can be taken out easily by an experienced pilot with cannons. The gunner coverage is very good all around, except for the bottom. As such, I recommend engaging this thing from exactly there. That being said, this seaplane does get a long-range bomber spawn and as such will be rather hard to get to. The USA Tech 3 got some love as well, with the introduction of four new vehicles. One of the headliners here is of course the new top-tier jet, designated F9F8 Cougar. The Cougar sits at the end of the naval line and is honestly completely overhyped. Is it the new best jet in the game? No, not by a long shot. In fact, it doesn't even really compare to the Sabres, Mix and Hunters. Instead, this aircraft is actually quite similar to the Venom. The four 20mm M3 cannons mounted in the nose are pretty shotgunning when stock, but with 760 rounds at your disposal, you have plenty of ammo to spray and pray. In comparison to the F9 F5, it is faster, has a better turn rate and roll rate, but has worse acceleration and pretty bad energy retention. It can also carry less ordnance, not having the option of taking rockets. Indicated top speed is 1041 km per hour, although you'll have a hard time ever reaching those speeds due to the poor acceleration. Wings are pretty sturdy, only breaking if you do extreme turn and roll maneuvers at top speeds with boosts installed. Overall, it's still a good upgrade over the early F9Fs, and a good support fighter with its good turn rate and extremely good roll rate. Oh, and it just looks absolutely sexy. In summary, don't fly this thing expecting to wreck top tier jets, but rather fly it in a style very similar to the Venom. In the right hands, I can see this thing becoming quite effective indeed. Another headliner, also coming in 1.63, is the M163. SPAA. The Vulcan features a 20mm Gatling gun firing at an insane 3000 rounds per minute. With 2200 rounds in reserve, this gives you a total continuous firing time of 44 seconds. The gun can travel vertically between negative 5 and 80 degrees and has a pretty fast horizontal traverse. The ammunition is split up into two belts, which allows you to switch between two different ammo choices. That being said, the reload is pretty long. The 212 horsepower engine propels the 4-man 11.2-ton machine to a top speed of 64 km per hour, making it pretty mobile overall. Armor is pretty much non-existent once again, featuring an aluminum alloy hull that can be penetrated by heavy machine gun fire. Your belt choices range mostly from HE shells for aircraft, mostly APIT belts for uh, lightly armored vehicles to a mix of the two. The APIT shells have penetration values ranging from 40mm down to 20mm at 1km, and such are mostly ineffective against all but the lightest of tanks. They also don't tend to take down aircraft in one hit. As such, I would recommend carrying mostly HE. The gun is excellent in anti-aircraft use, however it does require a small spool-up time before it can start firing. I recommend using it in short bursts, placing a hail of bullets in the flight path of uh, low or straight flying aircraft. But don't waste your ammo on faraway targets as single hits generally don't do much damage. Do try to reposition yourself constantly, as the characteristic sound of the gun can be heard from across the map and it's a dead giveaway from an enemy hunting you down. As for medium tanks, we are seeing the introduction of the T-20 Premium. This tank features the same 76mm M1 gun as on the Sherman's and the Hellcat, although it doesn't get access to APCR. It has a slightly faster fire rate than the M18 and a low profile than the Sherman's. The 500 horsepower engine propels the 29.8 ton vehicle to a top speed of 56 km per hour and also gives it a really good reverse speed. The horizontal traverse is mediocre at best, but the characteristic American negative 10 degree gun depression helps out with the handling. The hull armor is surprisingly good, as it is very sloped. The upper hull has between 80 to 90 mm of effective armor, and the lower hull is about 120 to 130 mm. However, the T-20 is a very weak turret, being only 50 mm thick at the front. Surprisingly, for such a relatively small tank, it does have 5 crew. In terms of playstyle, this thing serves as a hybrid somewhere in between the M18 and the M4. 
having good mobility and hull armor, but horrible turret armor. However, it lacks the 50 cal top mounted MG features on both of those tanks, only getting a rifle caliber coax. Finally, the very interesting M56 Scorpion. This thing is extremely tiny, fast, stealthy and has a massive 90mm gun. Although it looks and drives like a tank destroyer, with its narrow horizontal firing arc, it is classified as a light tank. The gun can carry up to 29 rounds and has a 10 second reload. It also has a massive recoil, which shifts the whole tank whenever it's fired, also shifting your aim. The tank weighs a mere 7.1 tons and has a 200 horsepower engine, giving it one of the highest power to weight ratios in the game. With the 45 km per hour top speed, this tank can get anywhere extremely fast. And it needs to. The Scorpion is one of the lightest armored tanks in the game, having a laughable 5mm gun shield that doesn't even completely cover the crew. As such, even rifle caliber MGs can absolutely destroy this thing. Add to that the crew of only 3 and you've got yourself a tank that gets killed as soon as it gets spotted. However, this tank does pack a punch, having access to a 320mm penetration heat FS shell. In summary, this tank takes the philosophy of a German tank destroyer like the Dicker Max, but sacrifices the gun depression and crew for extreme mobility. In order to effectively use this tank, you will need to know the maps well and constantly move from spot to spot, never staying in the same firing position for more than two shots. But once you get the playstyle down, this is one of the most fun little harasses you can own. I definitely recommend adding bushes if you have them, in order to add to the stealth. Next up, Great Britain. Starting off with the FV438 Swingfire, we have another contender for the IT1's cancer status. The Swingfire carries 14 mouse aimed AT gems, traveling at 185m per second and having 500mm of penetration. The two launchers fire up in an arc, allowing the missiles to be fired over obstacles. Each tube reloads in about 10 seconds, giving you an effective fire rate of one missile every 5 seconds. 5 seconds! This thing can theoretically wipe out an entire 12-man team in one minute. Completely invulnerable behind cover. Thankfully, it has absolutely no survivability if caught in the open. The armor can be penetrated by heavy MG fire and the chassis itself is very tall and boxy. It also only features free crew, which results in one-shots most of the time. And since the missiles are fired up in an upward arc, they are also completely useless at close range. To be fair, it is some of the lowest penetration amongst 8 gems, as well as one of the slowest missile speeds. But the simple fact that it can pop out a missile every 5 seconds was completely invulnerable behind cover from long range kind of scares me of the swing potential in the right hands. Thankfully, it does run out of ammo pretty quickly. Next up, we have the successor to the Mosquito, the Brigand B1. This light bomber features 4 20mm Hispano Mark V's in the nose with 800 rounds and can carry either two 1000 pounder bombs under the fuselage or two 500 pounders and 16 RP3 rockets on the wings. It gets a bomber spawn and as such is quite effective at hunting down enemy bombers. But to be honest I wasn't too impressed with it. It's decently fast with a top speed of 508 km per hour but the bad roll rate can be an issue. It turns decently well for what it is but don't expect to dogfight enemy fighters. The main issue I have with this aircraft really is the placement of the armament. If you go for the rockets and bombs option, they are mounted so far from the fuselage that any kind of accurate deployment is nearly impossible. It's definitely a bomber hunter and head-on machine, but that's about as far as it goes. Next is the weird FV4202. If you're rubbing your eyes thinking you're seeing the loft child of a Centurion and Chieftain, well, you're right. The FV4202 is a medium tank and sits just before the Century Mark III in the tech tree. It features the 84mm 20 pounder cannon, but has one major weakness it doesn't get APDS. In fact, the only shells it gets are the solid shot and the HE shell. The reload is pretty fast, as to be expected. It will cycle through the 50 rounds it carry every 8.2 seconds. The hull is essentially identical to that of a Centurion, having effectively 120mm of armor on the upper plates and 130mm on the lower. The turret is similar to that of a Chieftain's, although less armored. The front is a very thick 240mm, with the turret ring being 200mm thick and the upper turret front being effectively 170mm. The tank does feature a stabilizer which results in a very fast vertical traverse between the negative 10 and 20 degrees, but the horizontal traverse is pretty bad. The 510 horsepower engine propels the 37.2 ton tank to a top speed of 32 km per hour, making it actually feel more like a heavy tank than a medium. One key thing I have to warn you about is the absolutely horrible reverse speed of only 4 km per hour. 
If you get caught in a sticky situation at close range, it's going to be difficult to back out. The tank has a total of 4 crew, but thanks to the very strong turret, it has very good survivability. Overall, this tank has the potential to be very powerful at its tier. The good gun depression, fast fire rate and very strong turret make it an excellent hill sniper, but the relatively weak hull armor, bad mobility, turret traverse and lack of APDS are heavy drawbacks. Next up, a premium bomber, the Hudson Mark V. I'm going to be honest with you, this aircraft is mostly a collector's piece. It has two 7.7mm machine guns operated by the pilots, with two turrets featuring two or one 7.7mm machine guns, respectively on the top and bottom. The ordnance consists of six 100 pounder, four 250 pounder and eight AP rockets. This is absolutely useless. You can't really kill anything with these. The bombs are too small and the rockets don't explode on impact, making even near misses register as no damage. Additionally, this bomber is very slow and heavy. If you have any kind of personal connection to the Hudson, then yeah, the 700G price is justifiable. But other than that, don't bother, it's useless. And to finish up the Brits, we have another premium addition to the landships in the game. Joining the ranks of tanks like the Neubaufahrzeug and the T-35, this is the A1E1 Independent. The Independent features a 47mm 3-pounder gun that fires an APHE shell every 3.4 seconds. The turret looks very similar to that found on the armored train in Battlefield 1 actually. The gun has a pretty bad horizontal traverse speed and a gun depression of only 5 degrees. Less if uh, pointing in the direction of one of the 4 MG turrets. The tank has 30mm of armor at best, with the hull sides being only 13mm thick. This tank is slow and heavy, however it has one major benefit. Its crew consists of 8 people. 8! This thing has the potential of just tanking shot after shot, dishing out pain with its quick fire rate. It's definitely not the most competitive tank, but it has the potential for a lot of low tier fun. Oh god, this just never ends, does it? Alright, only the USSR and Japan left. Damn you guys been fighting so much new stuff! In the headlines is another top tier SPAA, the ZSU-23 for Shilka. This rather infamous beast features four 23mm cannons firing at 850 rounds per minute each, for a total of 3400 rounds per minute. The guns seem to have a very high muzzle velocity and will shred aircraft and lightly armored tanks very, very quickly. With a total of 2000 rounds at your disposal in a single belt, you get 35 seconds of continuous fire. The guns can traverse vertically between negative 4 and 90 degrees and benefits from a very fast horizontal traverse. The API shells found in the belts have between 46 to 23 mm of penetration 1 km distance. The hull is armored enough to withstand heavy MGs, but not any kind of cannon fire. The turret, on the other hand, can be penetrated by 50 cars. The 280 horsepower engine propels the 4 man, 21 ton tank to a top speed of 50 km per hour. It isn't the most mobile of platforms, but it's mobile enough. The insane fire rate makes it one of the best and most effective SPAA against other aircraft, other SPAA, and like targets like Swingfire, but can't really do anything against tanks with more than 50mm of armor. Do keep in mind that, like the Gepard, this tank has a pretty high profile, but thankfully the radar equipment on top doesn't spin around giving your position away as easily. That being said, the amount of smoke generated by the impact of these shells against the gun side of an enemy tank will either render them blind or set their PC on fire. Next is the SU-6. This aircraft is in the IL line and features a radial engine set of the IL-10s inline. The two 37mm cannons mounted in the wings carry a total of 90 rounds and are quite effective against tanks, with penetration values ranging from 60 to 30mm at 1km. They fire decently fast as well, but have a tendency to rapidly spread the fire too much. You also get two rifle caliber MGs, which can be used to spot targets and judge ballistics. The turret features a single 12.7mm MG, but lacks ammo. As for ordnance, you have a choice between six 50kg bombs, six 100kg bombs, two 250kg bombs, ten 82mm rockets and six 50kg bombs, or ten 132mm rockets. The aircraft is decently fast, reaching up to 480 km per hour in level flight. This aircraft is an excellent ground attacker, with the 37s providing enough ammo to go on long streaks. The aircraft is heavy, however, and doesn't turn too well, which makes it difficult to use in mountain regions. Next up is another Frankenstein monster, the premium KV-122. 
There isn't much to be said about it. It's literally just a turret of an IS-2 mounted on the hull of an early KV-1 with 75mm of frontal armor and 60mm of side armor. Gun handling is exactly the same as on the IS-2, tank handling like the KV-1. But at the dev server's battle rating of 6.0 it's a little bit too high to be honest. Except for being a tier 4 premium, there isn't really a point to this tank. And to round up the Soviets, there's also a new low tier AA truck featuring a single 12.7mm machine gun. Nothing too special about it, really. It provides a bit more punching power against light tanks than the rifle caliber MGs found in the predecessor, but only has 50 rounds per belt and requires frequent reloads. Add to that the complete lack of armor and crew consisting of only 3, and you've got yourself something that's not really good against either aircraft or tanks. Finally, we're on the last nation, Japan. Let's start off with the one everyone wants to know about. The Key 87 is a bundle premium, and as such I wasn't able to actually get into a match against other players. That said, the test flight was excellent. The aircraft carries two 20mm cannons and two 30mm cannons with 150 rounds per gun, for a total of 600 rounds. It features a super turbocharger, which allows it to output a lot of power at high altitudes, is very fast, has a decent climb rate and a very good energy retention. In a dive, this thing can reach up to 870 km per hour before redlining. It is however a heavy aircraft, and suffers from a bad roll rate and turn rate. Overall, this thing has the potential to be Japan's new best premium, and has a playstyle very similar to the American P-47. Well, if the P-47 could actually climb and had 30mm cannons. Next up is the P-1Y1 dive slash torpedo bomber. This aircraft has no player controlled guns, but features two turrets with a single 20mm cannon in each. It can carry a selection of two 250kg bombs, a single 1 ton torpedo, two 500kg bombs or a single 800kg bomb. The aircraft is decently fast and maneuverable for what it is, but loses speed very quickly. The nose turret is good at dealing with enemies if you can get close to them, but can't fire in an upwards arc, so you always need to point the nose above the enemy. Despite having a dive bomber designation, it actually doesn't fill that role too well. You can't release your bombs if you go at too steep of an angle, and you suffer a massive accuracy penalty when doing so. And the final vehicle to be released is the J1N1 Interceptor slash Heavy Fighter. This aircraft features a single 20mm cannon with 60 rounds and two 7.7s with 1000 rounds in the nose, as well as two turrets with two 7.7s each. Optionally, you can also carry two 60kg bombs. This aircraft is pretty fast for its tier and packs a punch with the 20mm cannon, but doesn't carry much ammo. The turrets are very effective against low tier biplanes, but the aircraft itself isn't very maneuverable. I can see this thing becoming popular at low tiers, but not too effective. And to round up this patch, we're also getting two new maps. Sinai is the new desert tank map. It's absolutely huge. Kind of like El Alamein, but flatter. There's buildings in the center, shallow sand dunes to one side and rocky outcrops scattered all across. Slow heavy tanks are not going to have a great time on this map, especially not with all the long lanes of sight, it's perfect for HGMs to abuse. But with something fast and small it can be quite fun. This map features a second scaled down version which only features the center section and is altogether more suited to all kinds of tanks. The second map we're getting is for air arcade mode only and is located on Greece. The white mountains, small villages, valleys and rivers make this map very pleasing to the eye, but as an RB player myself I'll never really get to see it. And this is everything you need to know about patch 1.63. This took ages to make, and I would really, really appreciate it if you share this video with your friends. And hey, if you like my content, make sure you subscribe and enable notifications for my channel, so that you never miss an upload. Before we go, I'd I'd actually like you guys to tell me what you're looking forward to the most in this patch and what kind of criticisms you have against it. I quite like this patch myself, but I'm not really a fan of the M60s getting nerfed in further and the introduction of more HGMs being able to fire from cover. But that's just getting into subjective opinions and I really just wanted to inform you about the facts in this video, so hopefully I didn't do too horribly. Anyways, I'll see you guys in the next video. My name has been Michael Boom. thanks for watching. Take a deeper breath and give it time You can walk the path among the lines With your shattered frame of mind The that you could always find
day We can wait right here and play Until somehow you can find A slightly better frame of mind